it's time for us to check back in with the thread that runs so true. If you missed any of the previous readings, just look in the description below for a playlist. All of my teachers but Miss Welch carried maximum teaching loads. My teaching load equaled that of my teachers until I switched one of my classes to Miss Welch. She divided my freshman algebra class, taking part of it in her morning and part in her afternoon class. This gave me one free period so that I could deal with the attendance problems of our Lansboro pupils. County pupils didn't give us this problem since they came to school by bus, remained at the schoolhouse during the noon hour, and went home by bus in the afternoon. Lansboro pupils went home for lunch. Often they forgot to return in the afternoon. At this time, an attendance officer was unheard of. The principal had to be attendance officer. If pupils were out of school, loafing on the Lansboro streets, we heard about it. The parents criticized the school if their sons and daughters were not there. They assumed the attitude that it was the teacher's responsibility to keep all pupils, including their own, in school. I thought it was the responsibility of the parents as much as it was of the teachers. I thought there should be cooperation between the two. I had never been up against this problem at Winston High School and Lonesome Valley. At a special teacher's meeting during our first week of school, we discussed this attendance problem and came to some very definite conclusions. We decided each morning to check pupils in their homerooms first. We would also have a homeroom checkup afternoon hour. At each period, the pupil left in my office would go to each room and study hall to check the attendance. If there was a telephone in the home of an absent pupil, we called the parent. If there was not, we asked the pupil to bring a note from the parent explaining why he was absent. If the absence was not excusable, we deducted 5% from his grades in all his subjects since there were 20 days in a month and our grading system was based on 100%. If the absences were excused, we let the pupil make up his work. Three unexcused tardies we considered an absence. We announced our conclusions and explained them in each homeroom. We made sure each pupil understood that the responsibility of his being in school and being there on time rested squarely upon his own shoulders. We explained to our pupils that we filed each written excuse they brought us. We told them their parents would have access to the files. Yet this system did not end our attendance problems. Unexcused absences and tardies cluttered our files. Before I started teaching at Lansboro High, I thought one of my problems would be the association of the county and city pupils. I wondered how they would get along. I remembered that when I was a pupil in Lansboro High School, the rural pupil was not always respected. There were only a few county pupils then, not more than a dozen. Now we had more pupils from Greenwood County than we had from Lansboro. I thought when these different groups were put together, each pupil would hold to his own group. I had missed my guess. They got along together. But there was trouble among the pupils. It popped up in the most unexpected place. There was a feud among the players on our football team. Jack Alexander came to my office one day after school. He told me he wanted to discuss a problem. I wanted to hear his problem. He said he had starred three years for the Lansboro Wildcats and Roger Sutherland was jealous of him. He had always played in the backfield while Roger had always played on the line. This was their fourth year on the same football team and for the past three years, Roger had failed to block for him when he carried the ball. He said Roger would block for any other ball carrier from the backfield, so he said that he was going to hurt Roger. I asked him if they had ever had any trouble before they played football. He told me this story. Each family had kept cows in the same pasture on the steep rim of hills on the south side of the town. He told me he and Roger used to fight every time they met in the pasture. They had fought in pawpaw patches with peeled pawpaw clubs, beating each other over the head and shoulders. Then he went back further than this. He told me their families had fought each other politically down through the years. He said they went to different churches. They didn't have but one thing in common, that the children from each clan went to the public school. When he had finished, I told him no generation should inherit the quarrels of an older generation. 
I stayed in my office and talked with Jack Alexander long after the buses had reached their destination and the Lansboro students had reached home. This was important to him, for he was keeping away from football practice since he thought Coach Watson was siding with Roger Sutherland. The problem was so long and so involved, I couldn't solve it. Next day, I talked to Coach Watson. He told me this feud had divided his football team into two camps. Jack Alexander had his following, and Roger Sutherland had his. Each had about the same number, and every man on the squad took sides with one or the other. The only unprejudiced men he had were his untrained county men. Coach Watson told me Alexander and Sutherland were the best men he had, but he couldn't have both on the team for practice at the same time. I told him to take Alexander back and to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with both men. That day after school, Roger Sutherland came running into my office. He told me that Coach Watson, due to my influence, had taken Jack Alexander back for practice. And when Jack came onto the field, he walked off. He said the athletic field was not big enough for both of them and that he planned to hurt Jack Alexander. I asked him to tell me why. He told me a story of the two families very similar to the story Jack had told me. As I listened to Roger's story, I knew feuding was not confined to people who inhabited the high hills, valleys, and hollows. The following day, Jack came to me and threatened Roger. Then Roger came to me and threatened Jack. Each came to me twice during the day and told me what he was going to do to the other. I told them to meet me in the office after school. There we would see if the trouble could be ironed out. I told Coach Watson to postpone football practice and to meet with us. Jack and Roger quarreled and threatened each other in my office. When I suggested that I might suspend both of them, they said that wouldn't solve their differences. Each confessed to their coach and to me that he hated the other. They would have fought in my office if the coach and I hadn't preserved order. You fellows come with me, I said. Roger, Jack, Coach Watson, and I walked out behind the schoolhouse. Only a few football players, eight or ten, remained to see what we did with Jack and Roger. They didn't have long to wait. Roger and Jack turned their pockets wrong side out so we could see that nothing was left in them. I took a stick and drew a big circle on the athletic field. Since there is no other way to solve your differences, I said, I want you to get in this circle and fight it out. After the fight, don't either of you ever come to me and tell me what you're going to do to the other. If you do, you'll leave this school forever. This suits me fine, Mr. Stewart, Jack said. Suits me too, Mr. Stewart, Roger said. They went into the ring. I had seen fights in my day, but I had never saw one like this. They pounded each other with terrific blows. Each man was a good boxer, but gloves for them made the fight too easy. We let them back up their threats now. The football players came around to watch the fight. Jack Alexander was 19 years old. He was 6 feet 4 and weighed 190 pounds. Roger Sutherland was 5'10 and weighed 195 pounds. He was 19 years old. He was the best muscled man I had ever seen. He was the only man I had ever seen muscle above his head with one hand, the heavy steel-based highway road signs. When these men struck each other, it was like mules kicking. They followed up short and fast. There were no bells in this fight. It was stay in the ring without rest periods until the fight was finished. The fight lasted approximately five minutes. Blood spurted. Faces were smeared with blood. Shoulders were red with blood. Then suddenly, Roger Sutherland reached for a stick that lay outside the ring. We knew the fight was finished, and we stepped in. We took hold of Roger and wouldn't let him have the stick. He was glad to stop fighting. Jack was glad too. If any more football players have any grievances, I said to those who had remained to see what was going to happen, this is the way you will settle them. It was a strange thing for us to see. 
Jack Alexander walked over to Roger Sutherland and laid his arms around his shoulders. Roger and Jack went to the showers together as if they had finished a hard football game. They washed the blood off each other. From this time on, Roger blocked for Jack when he carried the ball, and Jack carried the ball for many touchdowns. The feuding Alexander and Sutherland clans of our Landsboro Wildcats were solidified. One afternoon when we were in the fourth week of school, I got a telephone call from Jason Hinton, member of the Landsboro City School Board. Jess, I can't discuss this problem with you over the telephone, he said in his soft voice. I'd like to see you when you're not too busy. I'll have to see you after school, I said. That'll be all right, he said. It's very important. After school, I worked in my office while I waited to see Jason Hinton. I wondered what he wanted to see me about. I knew it was something that concerned me personally or the high school, for Jason Hinton had always been very kind to me. When I graduated from the Landsboro High School, he was the only person to give me a graduation present. He and Mrs. Hinton sent me a $5 bill sealed in an envelope. There was a note with the money, scribbled in Jason's almost illegible longhand, saying that he had seen me day after day walk to high school through the winter mud, rain, snow, and sleet without an overcoat, and that he and Mrs. Hinton were glad that I had stuck with the grind until I finished my task. Once he had told me personally that if he and Mrs. Hinton had ever been able to have children, they would have loved to have had a son as ambitious as I was. When he had a problem to present to me, I knew it must be one that concerned my personal interest. You know, Jess, my wife and I have always been your friends, Jason spoke softly when he entered my office. I thought it best that I come personally to inform you about a few little things. Something's wrong about the school, I asked, for I was worried. Not exactly, he said. For a second, I felt relieved. It's about you. What about me, I asked. I talked it over with Nettie before I came, he said as he sat down in a chair opposite my desk. We thought we'd better let you know the facts. It's a personal matter that concerns you. I hate to be the one that tells you, but you've always seemed as close to me as if you were my own son. I'm very curious to know what it is, I said. Two things, Jason admitted, getting his face closer to mine and whispering softly as if someone were trying to listen. It's about your clothes. About my clothes, I broke in. What's wrong with my clothes? Look at your pant cuffs, he said. I pulled my legs from under the desk. I looked at my pant cuffs. I don't see anything wrong with them, I said. Maybe the room's not well enough lighted for you to see, Jason said. What's all this about, I asked. Am I awake or am I dreaming? We're here together, Jess, Jason said. You and I... Jason Hinton in your office in this schoolhouse, and I'm a-trying to tell you something that is the talk of the town. Listen to me, he advised me seriously, as he got up from his chair and walked over to the window and up the blind until the rays of the afternoon sun slanted through the panes. Now look at your pant legs, he said. Don't they have a funny color? Aren't they sulfur colored? Haven't you dyed them? Dyed them, I repeated. I've never dyed a pair of pants in my life. What are you talking about? I don't understand. Well, you can see for yourself the legs of your pants are not the same color below the knees as they are above the knees. I believe you're right, I confessed as I observed the different shades of color. I'd not noticed it before. The sun has to shine on my pant legs before it's noticeable. And I don't know what it is. I know it's not dye. It's talked all over Landsboro that you've dyed your pant legs where they've lost their original color and that you've dyed them a color that doesn't match the rest of your suit. You know, Jess, how particular the people in this town are about clothes. You know what they expect of their high school principal. Good reports, he said. Every report I've heard is good. People are saying it's the best disciplined school we've ever had here, but getting back to your pants, 
I know what this is on my pant legs, I almost shouted. It's the sulfur from the ragweed stems. I get it on them as I walk along the path of a morning, and the dew dampens my pant cuffs and holds it there. That's it. But you have to look close before you can see it, I said, as I looked at my pant legs again in the mellow sunlight. Then you haven't dyed your pants, Jason said softly. I didn't think you'd done a thing like that. But you know how high school pupils will see little things and go home and tell their parents. I'm beginning to learn, I admitted. First time anything like this has ever happened to me. We have a rule here I must tell you about, he said. I've been explaining to members of the board you didn't understand when you accepted the position. We have a rule here that you're to live in Lansboro when you teach here. I sat silently while thoughts raced through my mind. Come to think about it, Jason said, breaking our silence. If you stay in Lansboro, you'll solve your first problem. There's not any ragweed along our streets, he smiled. Your pant legs won't look like they're dyed. You can keep your clothes in good shape. Is it compulsory that I stay in Lansboro, I asked. Yes, Jess, it is, he said. If Will Haddon can stay at the hotel and pay $40 a month for board and room from his $89 check, I can too, I said. After all, I make more than he does. Jess, I hate to bring these criticisms to you, Jason apologized, but the other board members know that I know you well. You're a member of the school board, I said. It's your duty. I'll move to Lansboro Monday. That's better, Jess, Jason smiled. Everything will be all right now. He picked up his hat from the table and quietly walked away from my office. My room in the Lansboro Hotel was directly above Main Street. From my window, I could see almost from the east to the west end of the town, and my room was high enough for me to look down upon the section of Lansboro toward the rugged rim of hills that fenced the town on the south. I could see almost every street and intersection except along the river front toward the north. This was the quiet residential section of Lansboro. Perhaps I was lucky to get this room in the Lansboro Hotel. I could not have gotten any other place where I could learn more about the town. I had selected it because it was nicely furnished room and it was empty. I didn't know that it was a key to the night activities of the town. My first night in this room, I shall never forget. After dinner at the hotel, I had taken a walk from one end of the town to the other. It was just like any other small town. People walked along the streets, laughing and talking on this mild autumn evening. They greeted me, and I greeted them. Many were parents of the pupils I had in school, and I greeted many of my pupils who were enjoying a walk on Main Street, same as I. After my walk, I went back to my room and made preparations for my next day's teaching. Then I switched off my lights to go to bed. After I got in bed, I couldn't sleep for the noise. It was not that I had come from the quietness of a farmhouse in W Hollow, for I had spent my summer in Asheville, Tennessee, not far from the Peabody College campus where the streetcars screeched night long around the curves and where the automobiles zoomed by like bullets all hours of the night. This was a different noise. Lansboro didn't have streetcars and the cars didn't zoom down Main Street like bullets through the night. The noise I was hearing was loud voices and hilarious laughter. Many of the voices were familiar to me. The laughter was familiar too. I got up from my bed and sat by the window. It was midnight now and the town was just coming to life under the bright moons of dry electric lights up and down Main Street and out into the shadowy by streets where the small street lights were few and far between. At this late hour, I saw my Lansboro pupils walk in the streets. I saw a few girls and many boys on the streets. My guess was there were 30% of the Lansboro High School pupils. These were the pupils that were tardy in the mornings. These were the pupils that made low grades in high school. And these were the pupils whose parents criticized the teachers for giving their sons and daughters low marks. Several of the parents of these pupils had even said that I should be removed as principal and that half the teachers should be fired. 
We, principal and teachers, had been blamed because these pupils had not made as good marks in school as other pupils whose parents accepted the responsibility of their children after school hours. The Lansboro High School principal and faculty had received much criticism about the high school teenagers drinking at night and over the weekends in this section of Kentucky that had long been dry. I wondered now about the parents of these boys. I thought they must know or have a pretty good idea where they got it. For where did the judge get his? Where did many of the businessmen in town get theirs? Everybody in the town, I was quite sure, knew where they got it. I was now finding out. I had heard about Lansboro's favorite bootlegger who sold a good brand of illegal whiskey. He had bootlegged for a living all the time he had lived in Lansboro and never once had the law of either political faction in power arrested this man. From my window, I saw him on the street, walking slowly here and there, talking to this one and that one. Though the weather was mild, he wore his top coat. In this top coat, I was later told, he had large pockets in the lining where he carried half pints and pints, each one in a separate pocket so the bottles wouldn't clank together when he walked. I saw this going on night after night. I knew this was one problem I couldn't solve alone. It didn't matter how much I loved to face a school problem and try to figure out a way to solve it. I loved to meet one, face it, and fight it. But this problem was too big. It was a problem for the town, county, and state to handle yet it affected our school. I couldn't go meddling in the town's business, yet the town's business was my business as long as it affected Lansboro High School pupils. And these things were affecting our school. Teenage young men would stay out late at night and oversleep during the morning hours. They would get to school late after a bad night. Many of them were failing their classroom work. Unexcused absence and tardy marks were piling up on them. I had heard the old saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Why should we have these things before them for temptation? Why shouldn't the parents help do something about them? How would I get these problems over to the people without making everybody mad at me? I wanted to use tact. I didn't want to be a young crusader, but I knew the life morals, spirit, and progress of Lansboro High School depended upon everybody in the community. I had to have cooperation. I had to work these problems through Lansboro organizations. I couldn't meet them alone. <laughs> Very interesting part of the book. Uh, kind of makes you scratch your head and, and maybe get a little mad too. Just, uh, just hard to really fathom that that setting of a lot of the different things that he described in this part. Um, go back to the very beginning. It's hard to, to, well, in one way it is. For me, it's not because I actually experienced this in my little small school. But when he's talking about that he's the principal, he has to deal with all that, uh, not just the attendance, but then like the fighting and all that, you know. But he also had a full load of classes. So that, that's kind of difficult to imagine uh, these days. Now, when I was in elementary school at Martins Creek School, uh, for instance, up until I got to be, I don't know, in about fourth grade or something like that, I guess, maybe even the third grade, I can't remember. But we had a principal named Mr. Smart. So Mr. Smart also taught. He taught like a full... He, at that time, we had split grades because our class was small. So like a 7th and 8th grade class, he would teach that and he would be principal. When I was in about 4th grade or something, maybe 3rd grade, he he, re he retired from principal and he went and become the 5th grade teacher and then I had him for 5th grade. But then Mr. Moffitt, Mr. Uh, Mr. Moffitt took over. for. Uh, so then when I was in 7th grade and 8th grade, I had Mr. Moffitt fantastic teacher, one of the best teachers I ever had. Mr. Smart was also a good teacher. Um, but Mr. Moffat was also the principal. So he was going around to all the classrooms, checking on stuff. He was, in those days, you could paddle. He was paddling people. He was uh, doing all the business work. He was doing all that. And he was also a fantastic teacher. So kind of the same situation that Jesse found himself in there. Um, and again, things are totally different today. Uh, but I will use Paul, uh, since he's retired now, as an example. Now, he certainly didn't have to teach once he became principal. 
but in the last probably five or six years of being a principal, and today there, it's so t much tougher, I would say maybe there's more kids, but there's more regulation, there's more problems, there's all that, uh, more rules and uh, laws that you have to follow from the county and the state and the, and the federal government. But um, he anyway, while he was doing all that, he also drove a bus every day because bus drivers are in high demand and they're just not, we just don't have them in our area. So his day was long, but it started with driving a bus um, and then ended, he'd drive the bus to take the kids home and then have to go back to work, you know, and deal with all those principal things, whether it was, um, you know, meetings with teachers or parents or whatever it was. So, so he sort of still was doing uh, more than his fair share and other principals in our area have done that too. Paul's not the only one, but... Um, that was definitely, definitely a different time there. And when he was talking about the, the tardiness and the truant and all that, I remember when we were little, that was just like a teasing thing. Some adult might say, you better not lay out of school. The truant officer will get you. I don't, to my knowledge, Cherokee County never had a truant officer. Uh, certainly not when I was young, uh, at all. But that was like a one of the little threats, teasing kind of threats, kind of like people telling you that uh, boogeyman will get you or something was the same thing, that you better watch it, the truant officer will get you. And uh, when he was talking still about the tardies and stuff, it was th things started coming to my mind that I hadn't thought about in years. Now, you had to have an excused absence, not so much when I was at March Creek. I don't ever remember having to have one, but at, when I went into high school, that's when that started. So if I was sick, I'd have to go in. I'd have to go to the office the next day and take them a, a note from Pap or Granny that said, you know, Tipper was sick. She, that's why she was absent. If you were tardy, you had to have one. And then that's what he reminded me is that I think it was the same thing when I was in high school. You could have three tardies, and then that equaled an... Um, equal to full day of being absent so that was a way to like make you cut down on being tardy um funny to put yourself back in that when you feel all nervous like i'm tardy or even if i had really been sick and i had to had to take my note in i hated doing that i hated going to the to the big office there at the big high school uh, it wasn't huge in comparison to other high schools but it was so much bigger than where i had come from uh at martin's creek so many things have changed, like we're talking about, you know, with the principal having to teach and like when I was a child and um, certainly what Jesse was doing, but definitely those, the being absent. And I, I still don't think that, that Cherokee County has anything like a truant officer, but they do take those absences much more serious than they did even when I was in high school. But sometimes I think maybe they, they went too far. I got mad at one of uh, Corey and Katie's uh, principal at the time because he, he, they, I don't remember now if it was Katie or Corey. I think it might have been Katie, but I can't remember. One of them had strep throat. So they had missed, you know, several days. And uh, strange, all the times, even though Corey and Katie are twins, sometimes they didn't, like all the times they had strep throat, they didn't give it to each other, if that makes sense. Sometimes you got to worry about stuff like that. But this was a time that one of them had had strep throat and the other one didn't. So she was at school, you know. So she was at school all these, I think it was three days that whichever one it was missed. And... Uh, but the other one there was going to school and of course telling the teacher yeah my sister's sick and I'll take her her homework and all that <laughs> and then I got a letter from the principal and it said you know just paraphrasing here but basically said you know your daughter's been out of school for three days and with an unexcused absence which she hadn't even been back to take the absence you know but anyway if this something like if this happens again or if this continues or whatever I will be I will by law I have to turn you into social services I was so upset and so mad, and one of Corey and Katie's little friends had been sick, and she had got, her mother had got the same letter, so me and her were friends, and we went in there together, and of course, we didn't pitch a fit or anything like that, but we just, you know, I said, I, I just don't understand why you would send me this letter. My kids are, don't have an attendance problem. They're good students, and I'm, I'm in and out of the school pretty much every day, like I, I help with the PTO, and, you know, I volunteer in the class, and I do all those things. So why would you threaten me with the, with social services? I mean, I feel like you know me. If anything, you should have just picked up the phone and said, you know, hey, Tipper, what's wrong with your other twin? I know this twin says that she has strep throat, but does she really or something, you know? Uh, and, of course, she did have a doctor's excuse when she come back to school to bring with her. Anyway, he just wouldn't have it. He just kept, and finally, we just kept both of us together, just kept pushing on him. And finally, he said, Miss Presley and Miss Rainey, 
would it, it would it be okay with you if I ever have to do this again? Because he kept telling us he had to. He was required to do it by state. He said, w do you want me to, if I ever have to do this again to you, if I just write in parentheses and say, I'm just doing this, it's not really for you, I know you're a good parent. And we just kind of looked at each other and we said, yes, you can do that. If you ever have to send another one, just do that. That was how silly it was. He knew it was silly too. You know, he should have used his own discretion. Anyway, so maybe some of those things have, have went back too far. Although in this book, we, I mean, you know, we're seeing, he, he finds out, Jesse does, why the students are not there and why they're not doing good. Anyway, that's a, a funny story from Corey and Katie's, Corey and Katie's childhood. You do have to wonder, though, Jesse says, he wonders, you know, he's to himself, he's saying, I never had to deal with this before. You know, I, I can't understand these tardies and these absences. I just can't understand it. I wonder if part of it was there in Lansboro, there was so much more um, attractive things to do as far as entertainment. When he was at Lonesome Valley and then when he's at Winston High School, they were back in the sticks. And it was kind of like school was one of the only fun things to do. Um, you know, in the very first Lonesome, High, Lonesome Valley, that's probably why some of those older kids kept coming because there just was nothing else to do. So that's why they wanted to just come to school. So maybe that was part of it. There was more of uh, enticing. And at the end there, he kind of says that we're putting all these tempting things in front of them. Shouldn't we not do that as adults? Shouldn't we, we take that away from them so that it makes them easier to make the right choice? So maybe that's part of it. Now, when I was in high school in Murphy, that was a common thing too. People, you'd always hear about somebody getting in trouble because we were in Murphy in town where there was restaurants, you know, and things to, uh, places to go get your lunch. They would entice you compared to the cafeteria food. So you're just always hearing about somebody that got in trouble for leaving school and going and getting them a hamburger or something and bringing them, you know, and coming back. So that was more of a enticement. Maybe that was part of it there uh, for Jesse too. I liked when he was talking about the football players. That was a real story, wasn't it? But he said they quarreled uh, in, in his office. They quarreled. That's an old word. Basically means fussing. But Granny would say that to um, maybe to me and Paul when we were little, if we were fussing. Stop quarreling. I want you to stop quarreling. I've said that to Corey and Katie before, too. Um, another way to use it would be like he was, like I might say, Granny was just quarreling at me. She was giving me a hard time and wouldn't even let me talk, like if I was, you know, trying to tell Pap that or something. So I liked that. I love all the language Jesse uses, but I liked that part. Um, and then one of the crazy things is who cares if his pants look like they were dyed? Who cares? It almost makes me mad at Mr. Hinton because I just want to say, What's wrong with y'all? You're so silly. You're worrying about whether or not his pants have been dyed. It, not the job he's doing, not how well he's doing his job. You know, that just seems so ridiculous, doesn't it? That they were worried about his pants. Um, and now we, at the end there, we find out they're worrying about his pants. Looks like they might have been dyed. And then their kids are 30% of the high schools out at midnight drinking and carousing on the streets. I mean, I think they've got other things they need to be worried about. Uh, but it's so crazy that they even cared about that, like they cared about his appearance to that point. And then to me, I'm thinking, you know, Jesse finally says, well, okay, um, I think it's the coach he says is staying there, so I can stand to do that too. I don't remember if he's the coach, but one of the other teachers is staying in the hotel, so I can I can do that too. But I'm thinking, you people don't pay him enough to be able to stay in the hotel. That's why he's wanting to walk, you know, live with his parents and walk. Um, anyway, that's crazy. And especially when you put the two together, they're mad about his pants being what they think might be dyed. I don't even know why that would matter. Um, and then compare it to the when Jesse sees all those kids out at midnight that should be, you know, should be at home and sure shouldn't be out drinking if the ones that are drinking. But he knows that that's directly affecting their tardies and their absence and just they're not doing good in school. So uh, really an exciting part of the book here. Of course, we've got to wait till next week to find out what does Jesse figure out. You know him. We know him by now, all the stuff we've read about him. He's not going to just let that go. He's going to figure out a way to... Um, to fix that problem. So you'll have to come back next Friday to Got a little friend there. You'll have to come back next Friday to see what he does now what he what he does to solve the problem I hope you enjoyed this part and please please leave a comment and Tell me the parts uh, in what we read today that jumped out at you if you had some of my same thoughts or if it was something else